I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, Dean of the Honors College, and it is my pleasure to have you join us this evening as we're talking about picking up STEAM, science, and the arts. Have a couple of public service announcements before we get going. Um, in deference to our panelists, we ask that you silence your cell phones. Um, also, I want to acknowledge um, some people who are here tonight. We have Stephanie Cepak, a uh, member of the Honors College staff. She's our communications manager. In the back, we have Professor John Beck, who coordinates all of these series for us and finds our wonderful panelists. And I see at least one other member of the Honors College staff here, Dr. Bess German, who's our assistant dean. Um, so I want to acknowledge our staff that's here. And also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this evening. We have the College of Arts and Letters, the College of Music, the College of Natural Science, James Madison College, Lyman Briggs College, the Residential College in Arts and Humanities, Area of Composition, Department of Art, Art History and Design, and the Department of Physiology. So we're very thankful for our co-sponsors that help us get the word out and basically show support for what we believe is an important endeavor that allows the community to see the strength and excitement of faculty here on campus. Instead of having to wait for people to come from other places, we get to celebrate the wealth we have right here on campus. Also have one other announcement on behalf of a student who um, Kyla Cools was in the curatorial practices class last spring and she is involved in an online science journal SCI and the aim of that journal is to create an interdisciplinary science and engineering culture at MSU. The magazine will highlight student, faculty, and community science work from the STEM and humanities field and it will also function as an online hub for science discovery and collaboration. Many of the broader problems of our day and age, pollution, climate change, environmental justice, cannot be solved by any one field. SCI's goal is to publish articles written by students to allow them to engage these issues and contribute to a more connected science community at MSU. And this is an excellent example of a collaboration between STEM and arts and humanities fields. And since I'm putting in a plug for SCI, I would be very remiss if I didn't talk about RECUR, the Red Cedar Undergraduate Research Journal, which the Honors College publishes, that actually publishes undergraduate work in research and creative arts across the spectrum and so we're pretty excited that here at MSU we're creating lots of opportunities for students to engage in research. On this evening I would like to introduce our speakers to you and after the introduction we will just go down the line. They have a timed amount for their presentation. We want to make sure that we leave time for you to interact with them and for them to have some crosstalk so I will move them along. Um, to date, we've had very cooperative panelists, and I'm trusting my colleagues will be the same. Um, we have Susan Bandis to my far right. She is a professor of art history and director of the Museum Studies Program in the College of Arts and Letters. She serves as a director of MSU's Kresge Art Museum from 1986 until 2010, where she curated numerous exhibitions and wrote many catalogs. She teaches Renaissance and Baroque art, modern architecture, and curatorial practices. Bandes completed a manuscript titled Mid-Michigan Modern from Frank Lloyd Wright to Googie, a study of architecture between 1940 and 1970 that will be published by the MSU Press in 2016. She is a member of the Print Council of America and is a frequent assessor and accreditor for the American Alliance of Museums. Her research interests cover a broad arena from old master prints to American painting and sculpture of the 1930s and 40s. Bandy's earned her doctorate from Bryn Mawr College, specializing in Roman Baroque painting. To my immediate right, we have Dr. Robert Root Bernstein, who is a professor of physiology in the College of Natural Science. He is the author of Sparks of Genius with Michelle Root Bernstein, Honey, Mud, Maggots, and Other Medieval, me, excuse me, Medical Marvels, also with Michelle Root Bernstein, Discovering and Rethinking AIDS. Root Bernstein is currently working on The Essential Connection, The Arts of Science, and Thinking Inside the Box. His research covers several topics, including AIDS, autoimmunity, 
molecular com complementarity, scientific creativity, and the interaction between arts and sciences. Ruth Bernstein also holds a patent for new agents for treating arthritis, and he is an artist. Ruth Bernstein earned his doctorate in the history of science from Princeton University. To my immediate left, we have Dr. Mark Sullivan, an associate professor and director of the Computer Music Studios at the College of Music here at Michigan State University. He composes for acoustic instruments with and without the computer and for both instruments and computer generated sounds. He specializes in the analysis and performance of contemporary music and in studies that relate to music that relate music to other arts and society. He is active in the International Computer Music Association, the Society for Composers Incorporated, and the Society for Electroacoustic Music in the United States. Sullivan earned his doctorate in musical arts from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And finally, to my far left, we have Dr. Lori Thorpe, who is director of the Residential Initiatives on the Study of the Environment, or RISE, which serves six colleges here on campus. She is one of the founders of the MSU Student Organic Farm and serves on the Farm Steering Committee. For the past four years, she has been collaborating with colleagues in the departments of animal science, philosophy, and sociology to study sustainable pork production and student ethical development. Thorpe's work has been published in Qualitative Inquiry, Agriculture and Human Values, Journal of Experiential Education, the International Journal of Sustainability in Higher Education, Resources, Conservation and Recycling, and the Journal of Ethnographic and Qualitative Research. Her doctoral research took her to the Lansing School District, where she studied the cultural and educational implications of a schoolyard garden. This study is the topic of her book, The Pull of the Earth. Thorpe earned her doctorate in agricultural education from Texas A&M University. Before we get started, how about we just acknowledge the panelists here with us today. And Susan, when you're ready. We're gonna work on a couple technology things. Give us a moment, please. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to run very quickly through many centuries, just to give you um, some idea of the intersections between art and technology. And if I had time, I would, of course, uh, talk a lot about Leonardo da Vinci, the artist, scientist, inventor, writer, um, here you see his self-portrait and also a drawing that shows him trying to work out what happens when you put a barrier into a water source. And then we could also look at the intersection of art and nature and his study of dissected bodies and how to figure out um, how muscles work. Uh, and the other drawing that I included is he was involved with um, warfare and he was trying to always figure out better ways of developing artillery. And here's his little enclosed capsule with people in it sort of getting ready to um, go to battle. But I'll move into the next century. Um, and I wanted to just mention Jan Vermeer very briefly because there was a movie uh, the last couple of months, Tim's Vermeer, Vermeer's, in which Tim, an inventor, tries to figure out what kind of scientific equipment uh, Jan Vermeer used. Well, it, art historians have kind of known about this for a while. Um, and 
the scientists of the 17th century in Holland actually influenced artists a lot. Here you see a Vermeer painting and what we call a camera obscura. It's the first kind of camera, black box, doesn't have film, but we know for a fact that artists used whatever new technologies were around for them to help them move from three dimensions to two dimensions. And I need to show this one of my favorite paintings. Some of you might have read the recent book called The Gold Vintage. It's about 900 pages. But this is an example of an artist who is also very technologically aware and very interested in nature and the intersection of nature and art. But I'll move to um, what I'll spend the rest of my short time talking about, which is evidence from world's fairs where art and architecture and technology intersect. So many of you know the Eiffel Tower. Um, you may not know that it was the gateway for the Exposition Universelle, that is the um, first World's Fair that was held in Paris in 1889. And it is, even to this day, a kind of marvel of engineering as it is a, an interesting uh, architectural artifact. So when we come to America in 1893, one of the next World's Fairs, um, the Americans had to do one up on the Parisians and George Fer Ferris, excuse me, um, built the first Ferris wheel, uh, which was one of the features at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. But the Chicago World's Fair called the Columbian Exposition because it celebrated the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World. Um, it looked back. It was a 400 year celebration and the architecture and the style here was very much neoclassical. It looked to European um, examples, lots of columns and arches. Uh, in fact, it was called the Great White City. And this style affected architecture for about another f the next 50 years. Uh, it isn't until the 1933-34 century of progress, also in Chicago, that we see a total change in architectural style. So at this point, the fairs wanted to be future looking. They wanted to um, prove that technology and science would kind of rule the world. And so here at the Century of Progress, celebrating the city of Chicago's centennial um, birth, we have a very different type of architecture. Um, this very streamlined, modern style, no columns, no ornament, um, and the architects and the um, head of the committee that headed the fair was very self-conscious about the message that could be given by the architecture. So this is a short quote for the Hall of Science, which was the major building at the fair. A modern architectural masterpiece designed to display the wonders of science and the industries related to it. The structure itself is something of a marble in construction and design. And at the fair, instead of using ornament and capitals and columns, uh, the use of light and sound and color uh, really made the building sing. So here you see a view at night and a, the facade of the radio building, which actually looks like radio waves, um, and the uh, actual figures celebrate the idea of music and radio and news. So getting closer to that half circle of the Hall of Science, um, this sculpture, which was temporary, all of these buildings were temporary, the fairs were either um, either existed for a year or sometimes two years. But everything had a message. And um, this one is man combating ignorance and this science advancing mankind. So I'll show you science is represented as a robot. And this is a little bit after Fritz Lang's Metropolis science fiction is coming into um, popularity. And you see the fair motto is rather ominous. Science finds, industry applies, and man conforms. 
and here the this piece has actually been saved, it's in the Joliet High School, and you see science, this robot, very cubic kind of figure, pushing a man, nude man, and a woman whose eyes are closed, they're kind of half blind, and they're being led into the future through science. Um, uh, this is one of the very popular houses. There were model homes. This one made of all glass by a Chicago firm called the House of Tomorrow. It was visited by some 1.6 million people in the first year of the fair. So this is where people learned about science and technology and new ideas. Um, this was the house of tomorrow where everybody would have their own plane and you see how the plane is parked underneath um, uh, on the ground floor of the house. Uh, I won't really have a lot of time left, right, to continue on the New York World's Fair. Uh, there was one in 1939 and then one in 1964. And the theme here was peace through understanding and the main feature is this large unisphere with three um, orbs that circle it. One represented the first American astronaut, the second was the um, Russian cosmonaut, and the third was Telstar. So the messages at these fairs are maybe missing to us now, but they were um, quite important as a way to combine art, science, and architecture, and the future. And my time is up. Thank you, Susan. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to quickly go through and look at art science interactions in several different ways, starting a little bit with my own uh, art and science combinations, and then look more generally at scientists working with art and then artists working with sciences. So my introduction to biology and the reason I'm a biologist actually started out through the Golden Book of Biology which was illustrated by Charlie Harper who was one of the greatest illustrators of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, he did a phenomenal job of taking what we would now call big data sets and illustrating the essence of things. Here we have the Galapagos finches that Darwin studied and I didn't really realize what he was doing until uh, I came across a article by a guy, about a guy named Mitchell Feigenbaum, who's one of the inventors of the modern mathematics of chaos theory. He would run around to art galleries in order, as he says here, to do his research. And what he says here is it's abundantly obvious that one doesn't know the world around us in detail. What artists have accomplished is realizing there's only a small amount of stuff that's important and seeing what it was. So they do some of my research for me. Well, that's what Charlie Harper had been doing. He would go through these complex ideas and basically abstract out the really critical stuff. So I was learning how to see science even before I really understood that's what I was doing. I was lucky, I got to college, I went to Princeton, I worked with a guy named Bob Langridge. He was the first person to ever mathematically model or actually model on a computer large molecules like DNA. So on the right, you actually see DNA down its long axis. And he got the, the cover of Science Magazine and put half of the cover was this image of DNA. The other half was a rose window from a cathedral. Most of his colleagues wrote to him and said, what the hell are you doing? Why did you waste time or, it's, or space talking, you know, with, with this thing, with this art, when you could have put scientific data up? Um, all of his students understood immediately because what he taught us was that all science should be as beautiful as art. And he didn't just mean that as sort of a metaphor or analogy. He meant that literally and that the actual aesthetic that you use when you look at an art, a scientific paper or a discovery is identical to the ones that you use in art. So that was a real eye-opener as well. 
I try to continue with this basic approach of doing art and science together. This is some of my artwork on the left there. Um, I work a lot with evolutionary principles and things that are molecularly complementary, complementary to each other. And if you just like look at the very center figure there, which is sort of in a, a uh, crimson color, um, it's a very simple figure. Every figure that moves out from there is a mutation of that simple figure. And each one then determines what kind of next mutation can occur. I actually think that this is how evolution works. Because one of the really interesting things about evolution is that everything we see in a cell interacts with everything else. We don't just have random evolution going off in all sorts of directions. Everything fits, literally fits at a molecular level. So you get what you see on the right there, which are called interactomes. And nobody's really explained that, but I try to explore it through my artwork. So my art and my science have now come together. I've sort of outed myself as a scientific artist, and I now send things into the publisher, so sometimes I get the covers of journals and stuff like that, which is also kind of fun to do. Uh, I've also started collaborating with uh, an art professor here, Adam W. Brown. He's a transmedia artist. He's very interested in using materials and methods from the sciences to make art. So this is one of our strange art pieces where we've recreated a famous experiment about the origins of life, but we've recreated it as a working sculpture uh, which also has a performative aspect because people actually come in and perform experiments and take samples and it works as a real experiment. We've been funded by the National Science Foundation, um, although this is exhibited in art galleries at the same time. So it's a real combination. Now, obviously I'm doing some rather odd things. So throughout my career, I've wondered how odd am I? Um, are there other people who have done this? <laughs> and you know, if it's not common, how uncommon is it, things like that. So I was very fortunate in graduate school to run across a, a article, it was actually a talk done by a guy named J.H. Van Hoff, the first Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. It turned out he was also a semi-professional flautist. He was a poet who wrote in five different languages. He was an amateur artist who sent out, you know, made his own cards every year to send out at Christmas and New Year's and so forth. And it's very interesting because the very first talk he ever gave as a professor was about imagination and science, in which he set out the hypothesis that the best and most creative people in the sciences are always polymaths, that they in fact exhibit and even train their imagination by working creatively in diverse fields. So one of the things that I've actually had the opportunity to do is to explore his hypothesis. And this is the data from one of about five really large scale studies. We've looked at literally tens of thousands of people at this point, um, trying to decide whether, you know, Van Hoff is right. So the basic message on this particular slide is we're looking at Nobel Prize winners and comparing them to uh, people that are just sort of average scientists. And as you can see, the Nobel Prize winners are many, many times more likely to be active artists, musicians, craftsmen, performers, and so forth, even while they're doing their Nobel Prize winning work. A couple of quick examples, Alexis Carroll, who got his Nobel Prize for figuring out how to basically stitch together um, the major uh, blood vessels when you're doing a transplant actually got the idea from learning how to do uh, lace making as a child. Dorothy Hodgkin, who won a Nobel Prize for x-ray crystallography, uh, was trained by her parents to uh, draw everything she saw from a very young age, ended up becoming a professional illustrator for them by the time she was 16 years old. Uh, the illustration on the bottom left was done when she was 18, and she went on to actually paint her x-ray crystallography data because she thought it was so beautiful, getting back to Bob Langridge. Now, you can go the other direction very quickly. Buckminster Fuller, <coughs> he had his geodesic domes up at some of the world's fairs, so to go back to the world's fair, people went to those. Here's an example. Don Casper saw the Buckminster Fuller uh, geodesic domes, got very excited about them. When he was studying virus structures, he said, hmm, if there are universal principles about how to build stable structures, maybe 
nature has already developed those. So he actually invited Buckminster Fuller to come talk to him about those principles. This photograph of Don Casper is by Buckminster Fuller when he visited it in his home. And you can see that, in fact, uh, the virus on the right there, which is Don Casper's drawing, he was a fine artist himself, uh, actually do fit the basic model. And here's another example. Uh, Fuller also influenced Harold Crudo, who won the Nobel Prize for actually making Buckminster Fuller-like structures out of carbon. He also was a designer. One final example here, uh, George Antiel and Hedy Lamarr, everybody in this room is probably carrying a uh, cell phone or some kind of PDA. Uh, the reason that you can communicate without everybody eavesdropping on you easily, maybe the NSA can, but the rest of us can't, uh, is because these two uh, a uh, actress and a composer and performer on the piano uh, came up with the idea of what's called frequency hopping. And this idea comes literally directly out of the idea of, of how you uh, compose for uh, piano rolls and things like this. So there are lots of connections which you can make. And uh, I could go on forever because I have lots more examples as well. But the really important thing is you can work it both ways, art into science, science into art. Artists can be scientists, scientists can be artists, whatever combination you want. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Mark? Stephanie, we may need assistance. Thank you. Assistance for the elderly here. No, no, no. It's off. One, two, three. I know. <laughs> it's all that beatboxing. Okay. So actually, there's an odd thing here, which is when I was 18, uh, and an undergraduate. I think it's on. It's on. Yep, it's on. Um, I had the chance to go once a month on Sundays to the home of Buckminster Fuller. Hmm. And uh, he had gatherings that weren't too much dissimilar to the gathering here, uh, except that they were in his geodesmic dome. What? Okay. Maybe what do you expect for a musician? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was one of my first encounters with discussions that involved people from the fields of design, sciences, arts, and so forth. And I was continuously flabbergasted. Uh, not to mention that these were casual, but things ranged over an incredible uh, diversity of subject matter. And um, he also gave out his papers, and many of them were written in a way that allowed lay people who were not schooled in science or even design to understand his ideas. And that had an incredible impact on me as a student, which continued um, Another program that had an incredible influence on me and which I think is related to the subject matter here, which is putting art into STEM education, uh, was a program at the University of Illinois that was run in a place called Unit One. And it was a residency program, but it was a kind of an unusual residency program. And it didn't just bring in artists, it brought in political activists and scientists and people from an incredibly diverse range of vocations and so forth. So in the course of six to eight years, I had a chance to spend six weeks going to seminars given by a neurophysiologist named Heinz von Forster, who founded the Biological Computer Laboratory at the University of Illinois. Uh, Umberto Maturana, who is a biologist from Chile, who wrote a, a series of pieces on a subject called autopoiesis. Uh, Francisco Varela talked about modal logic. Uh, uh, a man named Martyr talked uh, for a while about four arguments for eliminating television and, and so on and so forth. So again, this was a kind of gathering where there was an incredible interaction and dialogue between faculty, students, and visiting scientists, artists, social scientists, political activists. And I think that it's influenced me right up until this moment. So 
in addition to the kinds of things that the Bob has already talked about, one thing that interests me is what's sometimes called the intrinsic value of art. And since I've been here, I've taught a number of courses uh, in conjunction with people in the philosophy department, primarily Professor Peterson, but a couple of others. Some of those have dealt with what's called aesthetic theory. And one of the uh, attempts of aesthetic theory has to do with figuring out what art has to offer that science and math and law don't have to offer. Or another way to think about that would be what does art bring to the mix that complements the things that those domains have to offer? And what are the distinctive kinds of value that are produced in each? So um, we live in a society which at least pays lip service to the idea of understanding what's of value about science. And most lay people would not quarrel with the notion that science has produced things of value. When it comes to art, they're not so sure. They think it's cool, they like it, but they're not sure if it really has the kind of value that science has. And I think that that's partly a result of a historical production around scientific value, and maybe also partly a uh, lack of the kind of production that has convinced society that art could be of, of a value comparable to scientific value. And there are, we could talk about what led to that state of affairs, but I also would say that I think that if you look at history and if you look at the development of the human race, you'll find out that art has actually contributed quite a bit to the development of people that's not just subjective, that's not a matter of mere expression or decorative sorts of activities, it's really substantial. And philosophers like Hegel and Kant maintained that art was about social truth and that art helped humanity understand itself at given points in time and also helped to spur what a philosopher like Ernst Bloch called the u utopian drive towards a more desirable world and a more ethical world. And so in the realm of ethics and social truth, I think you can find that art has something to contribute that complements science and that leads to something that goes way beyond sort of pretty pictures and subjective expression that has no social validity. And probably we'll come to talk about that. But that's, is that two minutes out there? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm imagining signs that aren't there. So um, in these slides, this first one I think is kind of interesting in some ways in that it, I often get the reaction that this looks beautiful. And in some sense, I think, indeed, it does. And maybe because of the light, you might not be able to see it. But it has a certain kind of dramatic impact. But in fact, this is a picture of a tree that's been devastated by an emerald ash borer. And those grooves in the wood are the traces left of its demise. And I suspect that somebody who doesn't know that might look at this and have no idea whatsoever that this beautiful image is actually about something that's rather horrible. And that's one of the interesting dilemmas of artistic production. Um, how do I go on? So another aspect of artistic creation from a more contemporary point of view in my own particular case has to do with an attempt to find ways to get my own artistic production and those of students I work with to address things that I think are of critical importance right now, in particular things that are sometimes connected to what's called uh, eco-art. And so we've been working on things that generally touch on issues related to water, to here you see food, and these are photographs that were taken at the Student Organic Farm, and we'll probably talk about that in a bit. But uh, some of these photographs were taken, and the people who were there were astonished at how beautiful the food looked. <laughs> Actually, I was a Mormon, so you know this was really early in the morning, and it, it was amazing. And also the the shapes. If you know anything about fractals, um, when you look at that previous one, you'll realize that there's an all kinds of fractal imagery latent in that image. Uh, and some of the other images here have to do. This is uh, related to water. This is in Arizona. It's a mud hole that's dried up, and water is certainly a critical issue. Um, actually, you can just. This is another wa piece of water along a concrete wall. And all of these are attempts to make visceral and concrete 
something that we know about but sometimes take for granted. So water is an incredibly important resource, but it's also an issue that somehow often gets shunted to the side. The same thing with these trees. Uh, we take vegetation around, and there's an interesting article which you can check out yesterday about how wolves lead to replenishing the river in um, Yosemite. And the interrelationship of all these ecological phenomena are, is v very critical. There's also some coming up, uh, one more, which I think uh, also was at Student Organic Farm. These are the, the pigs. I don't know their names, but they do have names. And this was an attempt to find a way to, to turn photography to, toward thinking about animals and towards getting people who don't know animals and who don't encounter them to think about them. Part of that has to do with working with youth. And so we're working with a number of artists and composers to try and find ways to address issues related to water, animals, food, and so forth. And we'll talk about that more, but I think I am out. Yes. So I turn it over to Lori. Thank you, Mark. Is that on? Yes. Good. So good evening. Thank you for inviting me, John. Actually, when John called to ask me to participate, I questioned whether I was qualified to address this topic because I don't do basic science and I certainly don't call myself an artist. Rather, I dwell in a space of interdisciplinarity. I'm a boundary crosser. I'm a poetry-loving social scientist who dabbles in field philosophy with pigs on pasture. So first, a bit about the science behind my work. Animal agriculture is the primary driver be behind deforestation on planet Earth. 3.5 million hectares of tropical forest are lost annually to meet the increased demand for meat. This growing need for animal protein is responsible for significant contributions to climate change, land, soil, and water degradation, and loss of biodiversity. The National Academy of Sciences states that addressing the relationship of climate change and agriculture will require the sharing of insights by a diverse set of actors and experts from scientists and engineers to regulators and policymakers. But what about poets, musicians, artists, and philosophers? Environmental activist Derek Jensen says that if aliens landed today and did to the planet what the industrial economy is doing, it would be considered all-out war. Yet instead of rising up against the robber barons who fuel this madness, we continue to invest in our own destruction. He says we damage the ecosystem because we no longer recognize that we live in an impoverished world. But there are those of us that do recognize the beauty of this world slowly slipping away. And I am here tonight to bear witness to this. I recently heard Elaine Scarry, professor of English and aesthetics at Harvard, give a talk, Beauty as a Call to Justice. This unusual juxtaposition captured my attention and I began to think about how beauty and justice in our, in our food system might be intertwined. How might we translate this in relation to the beautiful farmscapes we are working to sustain? Professor Scary tells us that beauty is important because it presses us to a greater concern for justice in three ways. First, in the presence of the beautiful, we encounter symmetry, unity, clarity, and vivacity. And justice, by most definitions, requires symmetry of relations. So the beautiful object gives us a glimpse of just relations. Organic farming requires reciprocity or symmetry of our relations to the ecosystem and to each other. That little toad was found in those raised beds, by the way. And this embedded attention to just relations that undergirds organic farming heightens our sensitivity to injustices everywhere. Second, Scary speaks of the cognitive event when one encounters beauty. Here she says that in the presence of beauty, there is a radical decentering 
or an unselfing that occurs. Our self-absorption falls away and we are, for the moment, swept to the sidelines. Sitting under the glow of the heat lamps in the farrowing stall at midnight, watching our soft as silk piglets enter into this world, it is easy to lose oneself. This kind of beauty relieves us of the need to be the central character for the moment. And in an era of anthropogenic global change, perhaps it isn't more science that will save the day, but rather beauty will be our lifeline. Finally, after the exposure of the, the to the beautiful, let's say a purple Cherokee tomato in the August sun, there follows a desire to create. We may want to write a poem about it, as Neruda did, or paint it, or cook a marvelous dish with it, or photograph it, or go home and grow our own garden full of beautiful tomatoes, but the point being we want to replicate it, to bring more into the world so eventually there will be enough. Feminist authors Donna Haraway and Ursula Le Guin implore us to begin telling our small stories from the field. I promised Mark a poem, so here we go a poem, spoken word. These stories are important because they provide a counterbalance to the dominant narrative being authored by the power elite. Indeed, we had better start telling each other a new story, because the big boys are telling a monolithic story about GMOs feeding the world that just doesn't ring true for me. There are compelling food stories out in our communities, but rarely are they a part of our academic discourse. Troubling. My pulse quickens as I see these photos. It's a visceral reaction. My body is sending me a message of kinship. I listen, I feel, I pine for these animals. This is my fleshly practice, my pig earth communion story told from the fertile margins of our university from a place called the Student Organic Farm. This is where I go to sow my wild oats and dig in my heels and practice a different brand of science. Watching the spot fires on the back of my hands, I am filled with a sense of urgency for the plight of my companion critters. A gift curse to share the suffering of other living beings. This is my story of perseverance and love, caring and joy, catalyzed by pigs in communion with students. Our companion species were, were crossbred Burks, released from confinement to live out their life, brought to death, yes, killed, but no, not killable grazing on our pastures, all the while teaching us how to respond, how to be responsible, to attend to, to care for, and be cared for. I ask you, where do we learn this in school? This began as a research project to study the grazing activities and crop preferences of these fine animals, to study how to bring animals back onto the land, to repair what has been broken in two, but there was so much more in this contact zone. You see, our students are starved for contact. Students, hell, we all are starved for contact. Contact with human and non-human critters. Farm as contact zone, farm as healing zone, wet nose touch, gentle headbutt, hello, burst of hot breath, snort, means special greeting of recognition, you are my kin. Terry Tempest Williams says we are a people in a process of great transition, forgetting what we are connected to. We are losing our frame of reference. She observes this is leading us to a place of inconsolable loneliness, of unspoken hunger, and the only thing that can bring us into a place of fullness is being out on the land with the other. Our pigs brought us back to our senses, back to a place of fullness. Touch, taste, sight, sound, smell. Remember, we learned these in kindergarten. Did you know pigs bark? Have you seen pig play? Snouts dig through the soil, nibble on tender roots. They have a dunging pattern. Feel the soft hairs around their nose. No iPods here, no cell phones, no buds, no texting here, no way. Pig life grabs your attention and doesn't let go, and their life, if their life doesn't grab their, your attention, their death certainly will. This is where I grow my soiled wisdom, in the mud and the manure that feeds us down among the hidden critters of the loam, where one can never forget that death and decay feed life. I've always been suspicious of anybody or anything that is too clean. Farm as counterbalance to the cleanliness of the academy. Sweat and mud caked, tired muscles ache. We learned how to be fully human from our pigs. We came to, knew e to know each other as more than purely rational beings. 
Pig work is hard work, difficult decisions, emotionally demanding, crossing disciplines, complex questions without any answers. We grew in our love and our trust, drawing a circle around our most cherished pigs. Joy, sorrow, joy. Ours is a shared and situated knowledge, soiled, blood-soaked, tear-stained, tear -stained, but resilient. This is the kind of knowledge production I can believe in. Ours is a knowledge production of becoming with, staying with, accounting for all the relationships in our contact zone. Indeed, Donna, these species matter. Look at these images. These are the disruptive details of a story I don't know how to end. They are my excessive, transgressive, obsessive data. Please, no, never, not sentimental. Words fall apart, texts fail. Let these photos soak into your psyche. These species matter. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'm just gonna take a moment and hit some highlights of what was presented and also um, bring out some other points as John and I often reflect. We typically have a planning meeting before we actually have the forum and some of the things that come out in the planning meeting are pretty exciting. And so some of what we heard on tonight was about the intersectionalities of art, architecture, technology, science, on whole, I'm thinking about how do scientists use art to do their work and how do artists use science to do their work and how do the two advance to each other. Also thinking about what's the value of art. In our society, we, we all seem to have a handle on the value of science, but is art valued the way it should be? And if not, what do we do about that? Um, given work that's shown that the most successful and innovative scientists have not only an art but a creative streak that runs through everything they do. How is it that we allow K through 12 education to throw art away broadly? So I think that's something we need to think about. And then what does it mean to be a boundary spanner and to look at the connections between art and science? Um, when we talked with the panelists a couple weeks ago, some other ideas that came out, and, and I'll use this in case they want to cross talk with each other a little bit was really thinking about the historical perspective in terms of the influence of culture and technology. It's not new that culture influences what we do with technology and, and how has that changed over time. Um, I'm gonna encourage Bob to talk a little bit more about polymaths and some studies that's been done with MSU students and alums and faculty to see that it's not just a, a one point in time where we see that being creative and engaged matters and being entrepreneurial and innovative and at a time when the country is trying to chase others that have gotten ahead of us, how do we ensure that we stay in the game? And then the two cultures theme, our arts and the sciences broadly, are they really two different cultures? Should they be conceived that way? How do we bridge the gap? And, and how does that notion of science and art change over time? And then what's our responsibility given environmental degradation? Do we need to use more than science to make the case that we really need to be concerned about our planet broadly, not just for us, but for future generations? And so with some of that as context, I don't know if our panelists have questions that you wanna ask each other or additional comments, and then following that, we will open it up to the floor. I'll pick on Bob while they're thinking. <laughs> t tell us a little bit about the work that you did to see what Nobel laureates and sure. people who are very successful do. All right, so I showed you briefly the slide which uh, came from a study of Nobel Prize winners compared to Sigma Xi people, which is a, a organization basically any scientist can belong to. We looked at the general public. We had various uh, groups who we were trying to figure out whether the you know best scientists are the ones, like Van Toff said, uh, are polymathic, that they are creative in other areas as well. And the question obviously is, uh, does that apply to other groups? And more interestingly, as we went out and gave talks about this, People wanted to know, yes, but what's the economic value? Now, 
economic value is not necessarily the place I want to go with this research, but um, one of the big questions, which has already been alluded to here, is arts are not in our schools anymore. Um, they are the first thing that gets taken out when there's a budget cut and students are lucky to share you know one art teacher among an entire school district one music teacher among an entire school district and so forth so somehow or another you have to convince very skeptical people who are in legislatures to actually put the money forward to you know make the dollars available so that people can be hired so that we can have the education we actually want and need so how do you convince those people who are skeptical and who in general have had no arts themselves. This is the other problem with our legislators. They're not very well educated in general. All right, so you have to go to the bottom line. And the bottom line comes down to what's it going to do for your district or your state or your country. So we reframed a lot of these questions and went out and started asking how can we look at things that come out with an economic value at the end. And we came out with a number of things. How many patents do people produce? How many patents are actually licensed and therefore become something that is sold? And how many uh, new companies are founded? And we looked at a number of different groups. One of the first people we went to was the Honors College here and said, um, if, we're, if we're right, we would really like to take a look at the Honors College graduates from say around 1990 uh, through, I think we did 1995 if I recall. Yeah. It's been, yeah. So uh, we took a five or 10 year swatch. And so these would be mid-career people. Uh, we wanted to look back and ask them, you know, did you take uh, art or music or play in the band or do all these kinds of things while you were uh, in school here at MSU? Um, and now what are you doing uh, how many patents do you have? How many patents have you licensed? Have you founded a company? Um, are you still in science? All these kind, you know, how big a company do you work for? All those kinds of things. And what we found was a very, very strong indication that those people who were the people who were filing patents, getting them uh, licensed and founding new companies were in fact those honor students who were the most highly engaged in the arts and in the crafts and in the music and all the rest. Um, we've now done this with engineers. Uh, one of the studies looked at MSU engineers and compared them to Michigan Economic Development Corporation fundees. So people in the Michigan Economic Development Corporation uh, go through a very rigorous selection process. Everybody who wants to get money uh, from the state of Michigan to develop a new company has to file um, you know, huge amount of paperwork, show that they have a invention that is going to become a useful uh, product that will make Michigan a better, uh, more economically stable state, things like that. I think it's only about one in 12 of the people who apply actually get money. And so we compared those to other people like the engineers here at Michigan State, U of M, uh, who are the pool from which these people come. And again, when you look at Michigan Economic Development Corporation fundees versus um, the pool, and remember, all these people are successful. These are all people who have faculty positions are doing quite well here. But those people who end up getting the, the Michigan Economic Development uh, Corporation funding, uh, again, are much more likely uh, to be engaged in arts and crafts, uh, music, photography, and so forth and so on. Uh, so we have a series of studies now like this where they all show exactly the same thing. Perhaps the most interesting fact is um, lots of people have asked us, well, doesn't that mean that those people who are the richest now have a leg up on everybody? Okay, because you get to have those music lessons and you get to have those you know, painting lessons and all those kinds of things. And the answer is actually no. Uh, when we controlled for uh, family income, what we ended up finding was that those people from the lowest income groups uh, actually benefited the most from the arts and crafts and particularly the crafts. And it turns out that in the low income groups, crafts are very, very highly valued. Going out and learning how to fix you know, the equipment on the farm, uh, learning how to make things out of wood, uh, metalwork, all these kinds of things 
are things that people want their, their kids to have. Uh, it's going to get them a job uh, in a factory, if nothing else. And then it turns out a lot of these bright kids now have this, all this hand-eye coordination skill. They have a, a knowledge of tools, and they're the ones who actually are the inventors uh, that are making our futures. Right. Thank you, Bob. Did any of the other panelists want to add anything to the discussion, or do you want to to the floor? Your choice. I'd just like to, to introduce another component, which Lori mentioned, but in my own artistic work and in some of the artistic work that I've been mentoring and even in some of the projects that we've started with the organic farm, there's a particular condition about our current moment that um, leads me to think that there's a particular kind of address that the arts need to create. And so connecting artistic work in all the ways that Bob just outlined is no longer just a matter of creating bright generations and productive generations and entrepreneurial phenoms. It's become a matter of the survival of the human race. And as many people have pointed out recently, including people like Noam Chomsky, who we discussed beforehand, uh, we're facing a kind of foundation condition. And sustainability is not just an academic subject anymore. It's not a political issue. It's a matter of the survival of the human race, which to the Earth may be a matter of indifference and maybe to the cosmos too. But if we don't find ways to respond to some of these problems, all of the other problems are going to be moot. And that's s created, I think, a unique situation for the arts and one which I feel personally the need to respond to. So I've pushed myself to find ways to relate my photographic work and my music to the issues that I alluded to. This is not just sort of uh, a matter of being diverse. It's because I feel an intense need to figure out what can I contribute as an artist and what can I offer my students who are artists and scientists and social scientists that would be a response to this that's meaningful. How w can artists really play a role? And I think the answer is yes. But like the UN report issued last week, uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to be yes. And I do think, like they said, it's not hopeless. Something can be done. But the time in which something can be done is running out. And I think for artists, that means that we really need to put aside some of our traditional willingness to do lots of different things. Like I feel there's a real priority right now that's determined by, the, by the, what's happening in the world that says in a way, I can't just go make photographs about anything I want to make them about. There's a particular urgency to addressing some of these issues and I need to find out how to get my art to deal with that. It's not just anything goes. Thank you, Mark. Questions from the floor? Let me, uh, let me jump out with one to, to pick up on what Mark was doing and also uh, what, what really came out of Susan's original presentation. I think that World's Fairs for many of us in our life represented kind of a doorway into progress. That is, it, it, especially the future orientation of the 1964, uh, 1964, right, if I remember rightly, New York uh, Fair and the rest, and the interesting thing is that we assume scienti scientific progress. The question is, do we assume artistic progress in exactly the same way? That is, do we assume, um, when do people look at art as progressing toward kind of a future, I guess I would challenge you, Susan, to help us understand that, or do they look at it instead as kind of something that is generational that is not necessarily going along a vector or a trajectory? <coughs> Well, a couple of <clears throat> couple of comments. And um, at the 1964 fair, in addition to <coughs> Disney World and sort of the first computers that people saw, um, Michelangelo's Pieta was on view. And so that's a kind of backward look at an iconic image from art history. Um, so as an aside. 
Um, I would say up until really cubism, beginning of the 20th century, there was this idea that art built on the past. And in the 20th century, 21st century, the fact that people can sort of look at, towards the past and say, ah, he comes out of this school or building on that person, that's not really valued so much anymore. I mean, artists need to be doing something new all the time. Um, so I think it's for the art historian to step back and, and make those connections, but I'm not sure that the artists want to consciously sort of talk about themselves as products of something in the past or that evolution. Uh, okay. So now we'll open it up to, if you raise your hand, this is an exercise program for aging professors. They get to run around <laughs> and hand you a microphone. So uh, any questions, raise your hand. I'm coming around. Dr. Thorpe, I wonder if you recognize the irony of the contrast between your opening remarks and the effect of deforestation and climate change of having all these animals and your passionate uh, valuation of your work with swine. And I suppose there's some connection with the fact that I heard sustainable swine some of the, somewhere along the line. So could you please comment on that? Certainly. So 95% of animal agriculture, the meat, oh, yeah. Is this still on? Yeah. Um, Ninety-five percent of animal agriculture. Let me flip back in my slides so that I can show you. Let's just talk about pork. Um, that's what I'm here to talk about. Is raised in, in industrial systems such as this, um, and these are the systems that are degrading the planet, um, not the systems that we're trying to advance. So. These are what call, are commonly called CAFOs, or confined animal feeding operations, where thousands of animals are kept inside. They never see the light of day, and they are fed intensively. Um, they generate more manure than uh, a city generates, and yet that waste is not treated. So the, the, the opening piece that I was reading to you about is referring to our industrial, large-scale, intensive system of animal agriculture, beef, pork, poultry, all raised in that manner. And um, it's been so since the Green Revolution. We took animals off the land, and um, that was um, Aldo Leopold and, and Wendell Berry refer to that as kind of a, the great schism where we um, broke a perfectly um, perfect farm system in two and created a manure management problem and a, a fertility problem and a, and a problem of um, how are we going to produce this food sustainably. And so. What I'm proposing here is to look at how then do we respond and how do we raise animals so it is not degrading the land um, and bring animals back onto the land in an appropriate stocking density that doesn't um, result in deforestation. Um, in fact, some new pasture-based systems for cattle actually um, revitalize the land and restore prairie ecosystems. So that's perhaps the disconnect that you felt by the two pieces of my talk. That's a, that is the, so the feed the world mantra is something that we're continually <coughs> bumping up, bumping up against. And, um, and this remains to be seen. And is that the right question, actually? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Ha, we have um, the developing world wanting to eat, have a Western diet, much like we have. And so how dare we say we can eat um, in this regard, and you may not. Um, so it's a, what we call a wicked problem, isn't it? Um, how do we wrestle with this, um, with all those implications? So yeah. somebody like Tony Allen, who wrote a book called Virtual Water, says the answer is already no. And he said that if India was a nation of meat eaters instead of vegetarians, we would already have a global crisis that would be completely impossible to deal with. And the ratios of water that go into production of meat, which are about 10 to 1 as opposed to grain, are totally unsustainable. 
But I think that there is another dimension to this which goes beyond sh the sheer production of food for people, um, which you can find in something like the essay written by John Berger in a book called About Looking. He wrote an essay called um, Why Look at Animals? And in the course of that essay, he talks about how essential a lived relationship to animals is to us defining our humanity. And when working with urban youth, who for the first time in their lives come in to direct encounter with animals and for food for that matter, um, this is something that is life transforming for them. One of the people I work with said after six months, the big change is that they want an apple with their Big Mac. What really comes later is the astonishment of realizing where food comes from. Or like my daughter brings her friends over to show them tomatoes growing in our yard because they've never seen food growing. Because it's no longer, for me, one of the transformations I see is that when students relate to the animals this way, rather than as a commodity, it changes their whole food ethic. And they, they so currently in the, in the world, we waste about 40% of the food that we produce. And I would argue that we waste that food because we don't have any relationship to that food. It's very easy to throw away food that you have no relationship to. It's very hard to waste any of that meat that you know that animal that you produced. Every, every meal that you have with that animal that you've raised for nine months is sacred, is a celebration. Whereas food that you bought at a grocery store where you don't know the farmer, plastic wrapped, cellophane, easy to waste. You have no relationship there. And so for me, a lot of my work is about looking at these broken relationships in our food system and bringing those relationships back in. And then food is, is slowed down and it's something special and you eat meat on a special occasion rather than on three times a day with mindlessly consuming it and, and changing it from a commodity for consumption to something that's really quite different. John, there was a question in the same row. Oh. Science and art and how can we bring uh, that together, how does it come together? And my thought is that um, it seems as though um, that art is still sort of compartmentalized, that we're told what art is or what art isn't, and we can't seem to come to any agreement on what that means. To me, it, it, it's more of a sense of, I think what people have lost is the sense of being able to look at anything and seeing the art within it, or seeing the beauty within, within it. And I think, you know, if you look at artisans and artists, you, you, I always have the question, how is it that they see what they see in these colors or this piece of wood or this piece of rock or this whatever and how can they put this together and it's sort of they have a special sense of what beauty is and what um, is sort of in line with um, sort of a higher meaning in things coming together so m my suggestion is that we bring to people the artisans who have the eyes that can see bring to people what are we looking for? What are we looking at? You know, instead of saying this is a painting, this is art. No, this is a cabbage. Here's where the beauty lies, and this is why it's beautiful. And this is what, you know, when a photographer takes a picture of a of a cabbage or something, and it's this incredible thing, incredible photo, beauty. We have to be able to. I mean, we have to be able to look at the the entire earth. In, in, with those kinds of eyes. It's just, it's a, it's a different, you know, it's seeing, it's a seeing, I guess. I think we're missing that. So I think that's where maybe Bob's comment could point to something that's important, not only in terms of scientists being connected with art and artists connected to scientists, but implicit in what he's saying is that they get involved in doing it. So uh, Margaret Burke White once commented that the thing that attracted her to photography was not taking photographs, but learning how to see. And so, as soon as somebody gives you a camera and says, here's a pig, and you've never been around a pig in your life, and you're trying to think, what, what can I photograph? How can I photograph a pig? What is there to get somebody to see? 
you start asking questions that you've never asked before. And it changes your relationship, not just to pigs, but how you see the world. And it's the same thing with the cabbage. So I think part of this is not so much to show the products of artists as to get people involved in, in producing things, producing artworks. Lots of you know, music, photography, painting, poetry, everything. The experiential and, piece. Yeah, the experiential piece is, is critical. So it's, it's a compliment to what you're saying. Um, Stephanie, can we um, get some assistance? We want to switch. No, no, no they want to switch. Like to put up a, yeah. I'd, I'd like to respond to that as well very quickly. But it would be nice to show this, this slide again. Um, so uh, if you think back to the slide I show you of, of where my collaboration with Adam Brown, um, where we have this apparatus. I guess it's not coming up. OK. So, Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, so if, if you look back at this slide, which I showed you of my collaboration with Adam Brown, one of the reasons that we actually made this piece is exactly what Mark was talking about. But now this is from the sciences side. One of the things that's really sad about how we teach science is we left out all the art also meaning the artisanship, the craftsmanship, and all that stuff. So what we do and what the public gets are answers, or pseudo answers as is more likely. Um, they get data, they get graphs. That's not how we actually do science. Science is hands on, it's minds on, it's sensual, it smells, it has you know, tastes, it does all sorts of stuff. So one of the reasons we put together this apparatus and then made it central was so that people could actually experience the same way that you were talking about experiencing a cabbage. What's the beauty in it? How do you actually interact with this thing with your senses in order to uh, understand where it's coming from and how you generate these things and what's beautiful about it? You know No, I know, but that's that's what we're. Uh, this is a step forward. Okay, I can't I can't actually bring you into my lab and do this, but I can at least give you the sensual experience of the science. And ultimately, what we are looking for, and, and we actually have hands-on classes that we are now doing here in the art department. It'll probably be done with Lyman Briggs, uh, which is you know the science college here. These will be bringing students in to make beautiful things with their hands to learn how to see and experience science directly instead of just doing, I'm sorry, most of what we give science students is mind-numbingly, you know, it, you follow directions, you get the right answer. That's not science. It's also not art. It's not anything. You're not really experimenting. You're not exploring nature. Our, our science is just as bad as our art. We have lots of science, but most of it has nothing to do with really doing science. Okay, I know so we, we're, we're mis, misrepresenting that as well. I know we have another question in the back. Uh, this is actually follows that line of thought in some ways in that observation is really the entry point for many scientists and artists. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, the output of thinking about communication outwardly um, can you maybe compare and contrast the differences between art and science in their methods of communication to the wider community? So as our oh. panel is, is thinking about that, I, I also wanted to throw something in the mix tied to that. So we, we work on teaching students how to think a certain way. And part of what I also hear in the last two questions is how do we teach all of society how to see Right, how to see differently, and then how do we teach all of society how to communicate the, those things that we see and think about? Right, so how do we take it beyond the classroom, whatever that means, to touch all of society so that we have this new understanding of what is art, what is beauty, what of science, what is science? Is that a fair? So, I guess I have two reactions to that. Um, one of them comes from hearing people like Buckminster Fuller and Heinz von Forrester and Maturana. And as a musician who was being told by my fellow students things like, you know, you really shouldn't be going to these interdisciplinary things. You ought to be getting your scores done and trying to get into Carnegie Hall. Why are you wasting your time? 
And my answer was, when I went to hear this guy talk about neurophysiology, I wondered why I was going, and I sat there wrapped for four hours hearing this person talk about a subject I couldn't imagine could be interesting for longer than five minutes. And not every person who talks about neurophysiology can do that. But his way of talking about neurophysiology was like a magician, a detective, a story writer. I mean, his way of talking about science to me was art. It was theater, it was poetry, it was beautiful. The same with Maturana. So in the area of communication, I found a link between science and the arts that satisfied a really intense desire. When I heard them talk, I thought, man, if somebody had talked like that about science, I would love science. It was fascinating. It was full of suspense. It was full of drama and beauty. You know, looking at crystal crystallography, these kinds of things, I would sit there and get thousands of artistic ideas, and I would think, this is like cornucopia. So I think particularly in that area of communication, there's a really strong connection. There are programs like the Metropolitan Museum of Art that brings, I think, third year medical students in to look at Baroque paintings. And the idea is that the students are being taught how to visually um, understand so that they can communicate. The, I think the Met has something with um, detectives. They do the same kind of program. And you can find these around the country. So on a small scale, that's trying to teach people who may not have had the exposure in their education to how to, how to look. <coughs> and it translates into looking at bodies and looking at whatever, not just the painting in front of you. And let students should take art history courses, too. Yeah. <laughs> let me, but let me bring you back to this question, just because I, I still want to push the, the notion that was raised. Do we run the risk sometimes of not communicating what we're actually doing scientifically or not communicating what we're doing artistically in such a way? I mean, many people in the room, I think everyone, applauded after Laurie's poem because of the fact that it reached them. The question is, are we reaching enough people with the science? I mean, Mark, you're really challenging us from the point of view that the, uh, the artist has a responsibility to deal with sustainability, because right now it is the only question, right? Well, I mean, are we all communicating to the degree that we need to around a variety of things, scientific and artistic, especially where that intersection is? Or are we somehow falling short of really doing that communication in such a way that we're, we're simply not reaching the audiences that need to be reached, either by science on the one side or by art on the other? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely failing. But I mean, there, there is a, an understanding, at least in science, that that's the case. I mean, science and nature have a, an editorial almost every week now about how we have to improve communication. The problem is that people do not, in the science community, understand what that means. Um, and I say that as somebody, I mean, I actually come from the humanities. Although I run a lab and I am a scientist here, I started out in the arts and humanities. I took playwriting. I have done a lot of, of writing for major magazines about scientific things. But I had to learn how to be a playwright in order to understand that you need characters. If you're going to reach the pe people in the public, they don't care about the science. They care about people. And we know this from psychological studies. So there's, a, there's two ways you do it. How's the science going to affect me or my neighbor or my family? Or what's the story of the person who's doing the research? And almost nobody do th does this. I mean, they just they try and dumb down the results so that, you know, it's, it's a, fig, a number, you know, you are going to lose so many you know, hours of sleep from whatever it is. Nobody cares about that. I mean, that, that's not what science is. It's a story. Um, when we do graphs, I mean, I can, it's almost impossible. I have had meetings with all sorts of people at newspapers and magazines, Newsweek, places like that. They don't understand how to do graphing for a person who doesn't understand statistics. They take some expert who makes it so that all the experts can understand it. And it's perfectly accurate. 
but then you show it to an average person and they look at it and go, what the heck is that? Part of that's because we don't have any art either. I mean, people don't see. We live in a society in which all the information we get is visual and verbal and aural music. I mean, everything, we're bombarded all the time. We all talk about math literacy, science literacy, but do we ever talk about visual literacy and oral literacy and you know how you can use particular music to manipulate your emotions so that you want or don't want something or whatever? No. And so we have this crazy society in which we throw out a bunch of numbers and expect people to care, and then we show them a bunch of images and they can't even understand what the images are about. It's, it's, a, it's bizarre. Hi. Uh, is this on? Okay, uh, my name is Peter, and I'd just like to say that I feel particularly validated with my uh, jack-of-all-trades lifestyle, uh, <laughs> having taken a uh, drawing course, computer science, uh, vocal and piano, and then animals, people, and nature. Mm. So I feel kind of like, okay, I might have a feature here, I'm not sure. But um, it, I find it interesting. We were just talking today about um, the old uh, Bauhaus school um, used to preach that uh, form follows function, so in a sense that uh, art is secondary, and um, what are your thoughts on that, and would you still say that's true, or should they be more equal? <coughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I think that's just one side of the story. I think form sometimes f follows function, but sometimes function follows form. And you can follow that dialectic. No one wants to take that on. Uh, no, that, that was a good answer. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's nice and succinct. <laughs> it also is within the context of the Bauhaus. You know, so they were reacting against what came before, which was ornament. Um, and, well, ornament that had nothing to, that um, sort of dissolved function. So the Bauhaus comes along and they really want to do something totally different. I mean, there are still architects who follow that dictum today and you see fabulous buildings. So I may have heard furniture. a different question, but, but in that I, I heard a challenge for why is it that arts, or more broadly arts and humanities, are seen as something um, distinct and second class in comparison to other things, and, and why don't we see them on equal footings? Um, you know, maybe that's not an appropriate restating, but I, that's what I heard, and he gave me a thumbs up. You know, why is it that, that art's not seen as valuable and valid in what we do as STEM? Well, I, I can probably give you a, a fairly short answer on that one, having fought this one for 35 years now. <laughs> um, basically, I, part of it, it comes down to the so-called scientific method, which was philosophically and historically an attempt to claim all knowledge for science, okay? Um, there really is no such thing as a scientific method, but that's a whole other lecture, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons I do both the science and art stuff, um, is because if a artist can make a discovery or make an invention, then obviously there's nothing sacrosanct about a scientific method, because artists working as artists can do the same thing doing whatever the artistic method is. I don't think anybody says there's an artistic method. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the arguments. The real problem, I think, has been that for many years in the United States, and this was not always true, if you go back far enough, art was part of the curriculum for everybody everywhere, including scientists, mathematicians, and everybody else. But in the last 30 or 40 years, there was a movement um, for, of only teaching art for art's sake. The only reason for teaching people art was to train artists, musicians to train musicians, and so forth. Whereas if you look at both English language skills, mathematics, and science, it was very clear in the school system that you did this to train good citizens. And I'm not sure where, where or why that split occurred, but nobody ever, I've never seen anybody make the argument until very recently, it certainly was made here at the panel, that art is part of being a good citizen. Um, and so 
literally one of the fights that I had over the last 35 years of trying to bring science and art together was I would go to places like the Getty Foundation and they would say, well, we're interested in art and science. And then you'd say, well, but we need to bring what skills the artists are, you know, have to the scientists. What do artists do in terms of, say, visualizing, observing, patterning, abstracting, all these kinds of things. Make it very practical and tell people you have to be able to do this or you can't be successful, not only as an artist, but as anything. So when you make that universal argument, and they would sit there and go, no. Our only object is to make more people who know that a Van Gogh is different than a Rembrandt. I swear, I actually had that answer from the person who was in charge of the Getty Education Foundation. That but is our goal. And when you have major people doing that, it's very hard to... Within the history of aesthetic theory, um, there's a core of thinkers who have always argued that the historical mission of art has been to foment for the good life, mm -hmm. all the way back to Plato. And uh, Hegel certainly thought that art and philosophy and religion played uh, a very important role in the development of what he called human spirit. This wasn't a theological notion. And so people like Adorno and some of the critical theorists uh, from the early part of the century see what happened in science as kind of a deformation, as Bob alluded to, to scientific uh, thought which coupled that desire for utilitarian value with the development of capitalism and the development of products mm -hmm. and the sort of elevation of utility and profit to values that trumped other kinds of human value. And they also see art responding to that. So Walter Benjamin, for instance, wrote an essay called The Work of Art and Its Technical Reproducibility, where he argues that art itself responded to that by becoming more critical and by trying to keep alive the possibility of utopian desire in a capitalist system that was increasingly attacking that role of art. So I think that if you bring the, that question back to the developments in society and look at the role, how s science evolved within the development from capitalism, say, mid-19th century till now, and art, you, you have a framework in which you might understand both some of the problems that have evolved with science and the arts, and perhaps some of the potential solutions. We had another question. Hi, my name is Kyla. Um, from what I've been hearing tonight, I've been feeling like two of the major underlying themes but from this panel has been bridging the gap between the arts and sciences, but also there's been an emphasis on sustainability. Um, I think it's fair to say that s sustainability has become a real buzzword um, lately. Um, and I know the general public is already aware of this crisis, but in a way it's not really resonating the way I think it needs to be, um, especially around like, uh, like midterms and um, politically speaking, I mean, and like the election season, when you're getting, when the general public is getting caught up in arguments of politics, healthcare, gender equality, wealth disparity, how can artists and scientists really highlight how crucial sustainability is in this hodgepodge of problems that w our generation is going to be facing um, in upcoming years? Like, how do you feel? we, especially those of us who are students right now, can really be tackling these problems and making it more of a um, crucial discourse within our day-to-day -day lives. I think that's a fantastic question. And I think that question is gonna define the human race and art, whether it's going to exist and whether it has a future. I, I would, it would be, the, the utmost arrogance of me to claim I have an answer. <laughs> I just, I want to find out. And I don't know, and I think that's the most important question that can possibly be asked by all of us. So I'll be arrogant as the political scientist in the room. <laughs> and, um, because part of your question went to, you know, how do we get those in power to pay attention to the most urgent issues? And the reality is it's always a, grand, a groundswell. It's always a social movement. I mean, if you look at um, environmentalism and how long it took for environmentalism to become an issue, even to this day, not everyone really believes that climate change is, is real. There's still debates around that. And so it's not so much how do you get the policymakers 
makers to listen. It's how do you get enough people working on the problem so that they don't have a choice but to act on it, right? Because policy making is very short windows of time. So really you don't want, you don't really care if your legislator gets it today. What you want is that society as a whole is working on it from all aspects, and then it becomes an issue that can't be ignored. Remember, we live in a capitalistic democracy, and so it has to hit people where it hurts for it to make any difference. But. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> just, this is unlike any problem that's ever confronted the human race in that we don't have time for the evolution of education and knowledge in society that has accompanied other forms of gradual change. And like somebody mentioned earlier, um, with regard to the impact of arts on poor people, the loss of the commons affects disproportionately poor cultures, poor people, and so forth. So I think that this particular wicked problem, as somebody alluded to, has another feature that makes it utterly wicked, which is we have an extremely short time frame that precludes certain forms of gradual change and precludes that notion of gradually building up an e a more educated populace. So I think part of the question has to include how do we do what needs to be done in a steadily shrinking time frame. I think the other aspect, and you've heard it from just about everybody up here, is that education has become divorced from feeling. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's why I'm interested in bringing art back into science. Science is not objective. The answers may eventually be objective in the sense that it makes it something that science has to be a set of methods where if everybody does them, they get the same answer. That doesn't have to be the same thing in art. But I certainly care about what I'm doing, or I wouldn't do it. But I don't communicate that in most of my classes. None of my colleagues do. I have had conversations with all my colleagues, you know, how do you get your ideas? What gets you excited about them? And then I say, do you ever tell your students? No, that's not science. <laughs> well, how in heaven's name are you going to get somebody excited about going into science? Well, it's the same thing about you, the question you just asked. How do I care about global warming or sustainability or anything else? One of the things that artists can bring to that is that art is about reaching your feelings. It's about reaching your senses. And if we don't care about things, we won't act on them. And if anybody should have the skills and the ability to make the communication about the important things to the public, it should be the artists. And there certainly are artists who are working that way. But so, unfortunately, there are also many artists who are just like those scientists oh, that sure. Bob is describing. And and this goes together with the previous question, too, about um, I think a lot of artists are shirking their responsibility to get knowledgeable about science and to understand what it has to offer and how it could help. And I'm constantly trying to explain to my colleagues ways that they could see science as having something to offer them as artists. They don't have to have this sort of knee-jerk opposition with science. And many of them are like lifers. I mean, they go in and talk about technique, and you wouldn't know that they're dealing with feeling or anything that like what Bob is saying. And I think it comes from both sides, and we need to work on both. Well, let me, let me d try to challenge the panel then, all, all four of you, and, and uh, Cynthia as well. Actually, so what you're saying question. is that you're in the passion business, okay. that yeah. science is a passion, that an art is a passion. Often we've thought about science as dispassionate, right. and maybe that's exactly the problem. And because science seems to be that, that, that whole notion of a rational kind of thing, which makes somehow art irrational. Yep. And I think that, and if you, if you believe that somehow there's an irrationality to art, you would have a tendency to discount it, where you would have an over tendency then to value science, believing that somehow it's dispassionate or rational. Basically what, where you were going, Bob? We yep. all agree with you. Yeah, I thought so. We're, we're, <laughs> we're deferring back to two questions that oh, were on okay, the floor. Back, uh, <laughs> raise those hands. Uh, here. Yeah. First, let me apologize because this is going to be like a little long. Because <laughs> it's all over. I, it actually, um, it's like a little wet. You're going to have to keep the mic close to your mouth. Closer? Okay. Um, I don't is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Closer? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> so my name's Anya, and I actually have sort of something for 
each one of you, but it all links together. So I was really intrigued by the emphasis that you put on relationship. And that really resonated with me and like the idea of relationship in it and um, even how you were talking about your soiled knowledge. I think that is what science fears. It's dispassionate per se. It um, strives for the objective, which is a disconnection <coughs> from all the things it impacts. And I think our scientists lack the ability to communicate because they lack the ability to even, not our best scientists, but maybe our mediocre <laughs> scientists, they don't love their work. They just do it. And um, I guess my question then links to sort of the philosophy aspect of it too. Like you talked about experience and it seems to me that there's this underlying theme of art as experience, as visceral, as relationship, Absolutely. and how that sort of just doesn't, uh, and science is too, we just don't let it be as often as we can, and then, uh, what I meant to say about the, the philosophy was that all this talk of experience and relationship took me to phenomenology and like the, how there's like this inherent human element that we sort of lose in pursuing the objective, but we're deluding ourselves and thinking we lose it. Like it's still there and we're just, <laughs> we're creating this like, what word did you use, schism? Like this split that is kind of just biting us. And I would love to hear what you guys have to say about that, that disconnect and the role of experience and connection to the visceral in the production of recognizable, communicatable, impactful, meaning that can affect change. Laurie or Susan? Um, so, sure. Um, <laughs> I literally drew a web. <laughs> nice. Uh, I heartily agree with you. Or oh, I keep wanting to. Um, one of the things that's so powerful about bringing my students out into the farrowing barn and working with the animals is that they are engaging all their senses. And um, I have had the pleasure for the past five years to be working with a couple colleagues in the philosophy department where I've started to learn about this notion of embodied ethics. And that if we're going to develop an ethic around food or around farming, or around sustainability, it can't just be up here. It can't just be the rational mind. It could be, <laughs> but that doesn't work for me as a feminist, for sure. Um, and that we need to smell and taste and touch and have <coughs> this thing that happens when you're next to another sentient being. There's, my scientists in the room can tell me there's things going on here and being exchanged that I can't see, but it's very much happening. And it happens when we're with the animals and it happens when we're with the soil and when we're out there in the cold of the night. And, and I would argue that we're, we're technology is distancing us from all of that that makes us fully human and um, I worry where that's taking us and like so are absolutely yeah right right um, and the other comment I would make is um, there are multiple sciences whose science are we talking about here tonight Right? Um, and I think that's an important area for us to interrogate is, um, probably we don't have time tonight to do that, but I would encourage you, most doubt, uh, without a doubt, to, to investigate that and think about how do we construct science and whose science is it? And is it science from above or science from below? Or, um, you know, right. We have time for one additional question. Hi, uh, I'm Mohammed Islam and I was wondering, because you were talking about, um, you know, just in general, uh, trying to get the art incorporated with uh, science. There's a lot of um, like exploratory activities that's been usually done in uh, schools nowadays, and even um, at college level. Because I'm in um, the BioCore for Lyman Briggs with uh, Dr. Lucky, and a lot of it is uh, trying to explore how scientists at the time that they discovered what it is that they were studying, how, how they found that, and trying to go through those steps and trying to uh, relive those steps. And um, my question is, uh, how, do you think that is, uh, that's one effective way of trying to teach art and science side by side to students? And a lot of students uh, usually have um, 
a negative response to you, do you uh, to it. Do you think this negative response is not necessarily that um, they're afraid of change, but they don't know how to handle that change because they ha they've lost that uh, ability to recognize art, and um, they're kind of like a drone in a sense. And do you think the grading system that we have with the point system that kind of encourages and discourages uh, students from exploring these things? And so a lot of students are afraid to explore because they're like, well, I don't know how to do this. We've never done it this way. There's no protocol. And so they don't want to explore. And so they lose that ability or they keep it suppressed. So my answer would be yes. I think all the things you mentioned as discouraging that do discourage it. But I think going back to the some of the points that she made, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but um, there's a way to jump that. So when we get, and th there are people here you can talk to, when we get artists, composers, composition students, and photographers out to the organic farm, or working with urban youth who are doing uh, urban agriculture, and somebody says, okay, you artists, how are you gonna work with these these scientists? How are you going to work with these urban planners? Questions start coming up that they never ask on both sides. So even with the technology, for instance, some of the images, like this image here, is, is not something that comes out of the technology. It uses an older technique, but it's using a digital camera and it's creating multiple images. And part of this is relating to an attempt to get photography to show something that it really can't show, which is relationships and movement. So sometimes when you confront problems as an artist, it forces you to use techniques that you never even thought of. So I've developed ways, if I, if I want to reflect on the pigs out there, just showing a pretty picture of a pig isn't going to do it, because there's stock photo agencies that have thousands of pictures of pigs. People see pig, pigs all the time. That's not going to do it. So you start thinking, how could I create something with a camera that would get people to, to look at a pig differently? And so you start thinking, well, maybe if I use this technique, which sort of takes them out of that objective, hypothesized role and makes them into a relationship, a visual relationship, not a visual object. And so I think part of the answer is getting them to work on things together in experiential situations where they can't fall back on tests, where they can't fall back on the pat divisions between the sciences and the artists. And they have to work on a shared project with shared goals. And nobody ever expects an artist to get it right the first time. I don't know why we expect a scientist to get it right the first time, and that's what we, you know, that's, we give the grades that way. The one place where clearly there are connections is process. So what Doug Lucky is doing by taking you through the process is a great way because you'll find out that the way a scientist goes through the process finds a problem, defines the problem, finds techniques, tries things that don't work, redefines what the problem is, has to learn new stuff, has to invent some new way of doing things. It's exactly what artists are doing. And I've, I've done this for years. I give a course for physiology majors. It's a tier two writing course, but it's, it's on the nature of biomedical discovery. And this is exactly what we do. And actually, they all start learning the connections to art because I already showed you, so many of the Nobels are you know, musicians and playwrights and artists and photographers, uh, and it shows, it plays right into their, their creative process. They all talk about it. So actually just by learning the process by which a Nobel Prize winner did their Nobel Prize winning work, you have to run into the arts and how the arts and the sciences work together. So I don't even have to say that. I don't say it at the beginning of the course, they all learn it. And, and about halfway through the course they're going, wow, all these guys are artists and they're musicians and it's, it's like a discovery. It's like, great, they've discovered it on their own, so that's even better. I want to thank all of our panelists. I also want to thank all of you, including our faithful repeat attenders. We, we have several people that make it to every forum and we appreciate that. I appreciate um, the students coming out on tonight and I want to tell you that I have great faith in you. Um, maybe part of it is in my role, but um, also I just believe in you as our future, right? And, and yeah, we're leaving you awful problems. We, you know, we've just been bad. We haven't been good stewards. But, but I trust that you not only have the stick to it, to do it, but the innovation and the desire. I mean, your generation is one of the first in about 30 years that really is back to trying to figure out how do we make a difference in the world and how do we leave it better off than it was given to us. And so I trust 
that you're going to come up with alternatives and solutions, not necessarily the solution, but you're going to find your way. And so right now it might feel like there's all these ways to turn, but trust whichever way you go. It's going to be a right way because it's going to move us forward. We clearly can't stop where we are now. So just trust yourselves and take risks. I mean, if you ask anyone that's successful, they will tell you that probably the first 10 things they did were major failures. And if it wasn't, it was because they got lucky. It wasn't what they were really trying to do. So just jump in there and, and make things happen. Um, so a thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, we look forward to seeing you in the spring when we start up our new series. I shouldn't call it spring because our next one is in <laughs> January or February. Um, but please do keep your ears and eyes open to the next forum and all of our panelists are here on campus so if you don't get to talk with them tonight look them up and follow up with them thank you again and thank you to stephanie and john for all their assistance